This is Regenerative Skills, the podcast helping you to learn the skills and solutions to create an abundant and connected future. I'm your host, Oliver Gaucher. New Society Publishers has been a leader in sustainable publishing for over 40 years now. They're an activist, solutions-oriented publisher focused on bringing you tools for a world of change. They've now published over 600 books available both in print and ebooks, as well as an increasing library of audiobook selection as well. They care deeply about both what they publish and how they do business, and so the same thinker and doer approach permeates their in-house work and the books themselves. A certified B Corporation, they print on 100% post-consumer recycled paper, and they are carbon neutral, and they print only in North America, never offshore. And that's just the company themselves. Most importantly, they've got the best selection of books that you need to build your own regenerative ecological or community-based projects. You can check out their full list of titles now at newsociety.com. All right, hey there, and good morning, everybody. Uh, This is the first episode of Season 8. I didn't really give much of an outro in the past episode that wrapped up last season. I always take off January and kind of regroup and it worked out really well because all of December I spent visiting my family in the United States, introducing my partner to them for the first time in many cases and visiting members of my family I hadn't seen in a while. It's a good vacation. With that said, we're going to start off this season with a format that I've tried once before. It was actually almost a year ago. It was February that I went to Nicaragua to work on a water restoration contract in collaboration with Restoration uh, Restoration Agriculture Design, is what they're called, Mark Shepard's company, and was accompanied by a good friend now, Jake Takif. And basically what I did was record a journal of the experience and what I was learning along the way, many of the observations, and just a diary of a day in the life of doing one of these jobs. And that's exactly what we're going to start this season off with once again. I am joined with my good friend and frequent contributor to the podcast, Nick Steiner. How are you doing, Nick? Doing great. Excited to be here. And yeah, it's fantastic to to start the new season with a new project. We're really excited here. So we have two projects this week, but we will share all about that uh, going forward. Yeah, and so the exciting part here is that after you and I did that, I think, three-part series on all of the different options and considerations for, you know, restoration of... uh, the hydrology of a landscape or holding water on the land we got a lot of feedback a lot of good feedback and actually these are the clients that came out of promoting that concept and so they we've been in touch with them for a while they're active with us on the discord channel for the podcast here and we're at the initial stage of starting a longer term kind of consultancy and implementation eventually really focused on creating a water retention landscape on their farm We're currently in the south of Portugal. I probably should have mentioned that earlier. (laughs) It is key to the story here. We are in the Algarve region. And I've been here for a little over a week now visiting other farms. We had a climate farmers team retreat to plan out some of the strategy for the year. I went to go see another farm of a friend, Henry, who's also been on the podcast. He just bought a farm recently and we checked out that space. And today we're going to start to focus on the key learnings from reading the landscape on the farm out here, the major patterns in the ecology, and things that we can deduce that can give us insights into how to approach the design process of a restoration landscape and inform the decisions for implementation later on. I'm going to stop it there before we go into too much detail because we're going to be doing recaps throughout the day where we talk about in detail the process of doing this, what we've learned, and we've also got some really cool questions from the community on Discord that we're going to be answering systematically uh, as I check in on these other days. All right, Nick, it's just about time to get on, out on site. Let's go. Let's go. All right, so this is actually the next morning from when we just recorded that intro, and part of the reason why we didn't record last night at the end of the day was not because we were tired. It was actually a really good day. I had a bit of energy at the end, but the room that we're staying in echoes like crazy, and I figured that the acoustics would be better out here. So we are sitting in the town square in the little town of Santa Cruz in uh, the Algarve in southern Portugal with a beautiful sunrise coming up and quite a lot of birds here in this little park. Hopefully you can hear them. It's a lovely little ambiance here. 
sipping coffee and getting ready for the day. So, Nick, let's start by talking about our overall impression of the land yesterday. Um, yeah, first when we arrived, it was really beautiful. So they have these nice rolling hills, so very gentle valleys, just everything flows very, very gently, no real steep hills. And when we arrived, it's just a beautiful montado system. So you have these uh, oaks that are in there in between, a bit of pasture, some other plants. And the most beautiful part, when we arrived, it was almost steamy because there was so much dew on the on the plants and it slowly went into the air. So, yeah, absolutely beautiful. It was really cold, but blue skies. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine a nicer way to, to start a week like that. Yeah, and by really cold, we mean, <laughs> to keep things in perspective, I think like eight degrees. Which is incredibly yeah, cold. Nick's blood has thinned out a lot since he has lived on the island of Tenerife. I, <laughs> I did not need a coat, <laughs> in contrast. It was freezing. Okay, you need to calm down. So we spent the day mostly first walking the perimeter of the land. Do you remember how many hectares that plot is? I'm going to say like 80? Yeah, I think 80. I think 80, more or less. And it's not a super wild shape, and so we kind of just went along the perimeter. Like he said, the soft topography of the area was not hard to traverse. And really we're looking for major indicators about where water flows, other than the obvious ones of the valleys in between the hills. And if there were any areas that showed signs of unusual variations in the landscape, such as, you know, springs coming out, more vegetation in a certain area than others, or dry spots even within valleys, any anomalies that were not super obvious just by passing over. And a lot of what I was picking up was the difference in between the texture of the earth itself in areas where the dominant plants were in the cystus family, there's really two that we identified through through little apps. There's gum cystus and there's Montpelier rock rose, which are both part of the same family. They're very drought tolerant bushes that occupy usually about a meter to maybe two meters. They're all quite uniform. It was clear that they grew back from you know the latest event of tilling the the hillsides. And so you get this kind of uniform blanket, uh, very dark green. These are kind of oily and medicinal plants. You can, you can make products out of the essential oils that you get from them. And because of, I think, partly the warm winter that we've been having in this part, as well as some of the new rain that fell in last week, there's a lot of new growth on these, and even some of them have started to flower. So it gives an indication about where we are in the plant's life cycle, even in kind of the off-season, the winter, as you would see it. And that ground was quite rough, a lot of texture in it. And then as soon as you started to get into the pastures where the grasses and the forbs were more dominant, it became a lot softer, much less texture in the landscape. And... You know, it's a little bit deceptive when you come out here in wintertime after it's rained a lot. And honestly, the hillsides look like something out of an English landscape. They're all very green. And that's really in contrast to how they look most of the year. Nick, you've lived and worked around these areas quite a bit. Maybe tell us about the patterns that you're more familiar with for, for most of the year. Yeah, I think it's really helpful to not just get a snapshot at one point in time here because especially July, August these hills unless they have been under regenerative management for quite some time are generally brown so or actively if, irrigated yeah yeah <laughs> the these hills they they almost look like a desert most of the year so it's it's really brown and yeah deserted not much growth and now when you see it you would think like oh wow there's so much water there's no issue with that like why would you why would you spend that much energy and time on water management um, but that's a good thing that we've worked in these landscapes for, for quite a bit and um, yeah it gives us a bit of an idea of what we have to do because generally what happens in these landscapes is that during winter so at the moment you have crazy amounts of of rain so it rains a lot and often we now see these patterns of having heavy rainfalls within a few days, sometimes even one day, that can even lead to flooding in some landscapes. 
So the main goal for us needs to be like, how can we store that water in the ground or in water bodies and all that? So how can we make it available longer throughout the year and kind of buffer, buffer this landscape? And so that was one of the main things we did yesterday is try to see where does water accumulate naturally? So kind of where does water want to be? Where is it flowing? Where is it maybe causing some problems? And where could be points where with a little bit of work we could achieve quite a lot? But yeah, maybe you want to go a bit deeper into that process. For sure. And like you said, because of the recent rains, there's a real advantage to seeing and following the water. I mean, it's second only to being out there when it's actively raining. And in the soft valleys in between the hills, the water was still quite saturated in the landscape. Even in areas of pretty high compaction, we were digging in just kind of superficially in the top layer. And you could often get a handful of earth there that you could squeeze droplets of water out of. <laughs> we got two dogs from the from the community like wrestling over in the side. I'm not sure if you can hear them. And so looking at where water accumulates naturally, like Nick said, and where a water body is almost being asked by the landscape to be installed, you know, not necessarily pushing it or trying to force it to happen either higher up or further along a ridge when it's already accumulating in places. Another indicator that I really liked picking up on was the, the plant communities and how quickly they shifted in certain areas. So I mentioned the cystus and then the more pasture grasses. I was seeing a lot of annual chamomile coming up, which is an indication of fairly decent nutrition in the soil and that there's a presence of water, which, I mean, you could see from the surface as well. But how it was coming up in different patches was interesting to observe. And where the livestock, the sheep and the goats had been fed in the past and there was accumulation of hay, there was also a lot of deposition of small seeds and you'd see regrowth of, you know, rye or wheat or whatever the, the hay grasses are. The thing is, early in the regrowth, and when you first see the leaves coming up, it can be hard to identify, especially grass species, which I mostly know how to distinguish from the seed heads, and we're still a long way off from those. But you can definitely see the difference between where grasses and where more early successional forbs, like things from the dandelion lion family, things from the brassica and like turnip family that are putting down long tap roots and are working against the, the compaction in the area where they're growing are coming up. And also how much the same plant is expressing itself in different places. So in areas of high compaction, you'll often just see some of the new leaves and little else. And then in areas where it's less compacted and water's been able to infiltrate, but especially roots have been able to express themselves and, and get down further, the exact same plant maybe will be four to five times the size. And that's a good visual indicator of compaction without having to do any extra digging. And, I mean, there's a lot of other smaller things that we observed on the landscape, but today we're going to go deeper into the analysis and start taking soil samples, looking at the difference in texture and things like bulk density or configuration or distribution of clay, silt, sand, gravel. And the different materials are going to give us different options as to what sort of water bodies we can put in. Obviously, if there's less clay... If there is material that infiltrates more, it's going to be less likely that we'll be able to hold water in the landscape for long periods of time. It's more likely that we'll be able to just infiltrate them. If you do have dense and sticky clay, it will be easier to hold water in, let's say, a pond or, or a dam later into the season. And this is what we're going to be looking at now. We had a little hiccup with getting an excavator. We had one scheduled for today that they had tried to rent from the municipality, but at the last minute they said that it wasn't available. So we're going to try for tomorrow now. But there's still quite a lot that we can do with simple materials. Maybe you can go over some of the other analysis that we're going to try today. Yeah, one very simple test that, that we're going to do is basically, yeah, I keep calling it the sausage test. I'm pretty sure there's a better word for it. <laughs> but basically we're grabbing a little bit of soil and then we're seeing it needs a bit of moisture in it. So it can't be too dry. It also can't be too wet. So it just needs the right amount. And then we try to form yeah a bit of a sausage and we will see 
how long we can form that. And basically what you can determine with that is seeing if you have a lot of clay in the soil, you can form really long ones and, and they're stable. On the other extreme, if you would have a very sandy soil, you can do almost nothing and then there's everything in between. So that gives us a bit of an idea of how much clay we have to work with in certain areas. And it's something that you can do very simply just on the go. It's also what we already did a bit yesterday while walking around. And then we will also do a jar tests, so basically where we mix um, a bit of the soil inside a jar with water, then shake it heavily and let it sit overnight. And then depending on how it sits or how it basically comes down in the water, we can see the different layers and that gives us a bit of an idea of, of the composition. And yeah, those tests are, are very simple and that's why we love them because you can just do them out in the field, you can quickly do them and you can get an idea of what you have to deal with. And for some features, that's already enough. And so lastly, we're also taking little videos and a lot of pictures out in the field and we have permission from the site owners to publish them. And so I'll link to both of our social media accounts in different places, including Discord, where I'll be sharing these for some of the specific observations that we're getting in the field, including the state and the health of the dam that already exists on the land. There's a lot of trees growing in there and why that's difficult and some things that we could do for maintenance. So there's going to be a lot more that we will add to this discussion through visual resources, which can help to illustrate them even better. So I'll encourage you to check those out uh, through links on the website and our social media accounts. And we got to get out on site now. So I will check in again at the end of the day or early tomorrow and share some of the learnings that we're going to be gathering today. Okay, so this is actually the third day. We skipped recording on the second day, but we'll do a recap right now. Um, so we took the second day to focus on, first of all, seeing the second farm. There's a second piece of land that's disconnected from the primary one, which we didn't get time to go and sort of assess the first day. Very similar landscape, but there are some larger peaks that create a bit of a different watershed. And the areas where water had pooled up were very close to the neighbor's land and we're mostly getting lost to that side. Another one of the things that was unique about what the plan was for that piece of land is that they're going to trial about a one hectare site for vineyard. And so the assessment of that area was focused on kind of the water holding capacity for the ability for irrigation, just to get the vines established in the beginning and looking more into the soil of that area. Nick, what else did we focus on on the second day? Yeah, we also wanted to find out a bit like what would be strategic points where we could hold water a little bit longer and what would be possible yeah, on that site. And luckily the, the area that they had already identified where they want to work with grapes, there are two kind of small gentle valleys that are flowing together into one. And so there was one spot that was still quite wet. It had some water spots even some running water still so we found a spot that could be quite nice to build a water feature and then yeah we just did some other spots we did some infiltration tests so we wanted to see how is yeah the soil behaving when it rains and we just had some heavy rains last week so that was quite interesting to see there's definitely a lot of work ahead of us to get the infiltration rate Higher, but what was nice is that we found a few potential spots to hold water, to infiltrate it. And furthermore, there's also one spot where the property is losing quite a bit of water to the neighbor's property. And so with the laser level, we checked a bit if it would be possible to get that water into the valley. It's going to be a bit tricky, but yeah, we, we see quite a bit of potential to increase the yeah, hydration on, on that property in a, in a positive direction. Yeah, and when I'm talking about doing some analysis of the soil as well, we're not really bringing around chem tests or grabbing anything to send to a lab. They have some lab tests that they did when they originally purchased the place, and that's good enough for me for baseline. And also, I'm not an agronomist. I'm not going to pretend to tell you <laughs> what all the different mineral balances mean. It's not a specialty of mine. What I did instead was bring around an infiltration cylinder and take samples about how long it takes for water to infiltrate. Now since a lot of the soil was already saturated, especially down in the valleys, I wasn't able to test those spots with, with that test specifically. But up on the ridges where things had dried out enough, they were still moist, but it just means you didn't have to wait for the second reading. And I've also made some instructional videos on how I do these tests, and I'll try and 
uh, share these in the website and on social media as well in case anybody's interested. So once we did the site analysis at the second place, I focused on the afternoon in understanding the larger context in the community of their area and speak with some of their neighbors. Specifically, one of the neighbors that they have in the small town right near the farm, they have a dairy business and they make cheese on site and they manage a huge amount of land. Uh, after speaking with them, I realized they have about 2,200 hectares in management between what they own and what they rent. And I even wrote this down during the interview that accommodates 800 goats, 600 sheep, and 120 cows, which sounds like a lot, but honestly, from what I've seen and the carrying capacity of other places of even a smaller footprint, that's not a huge amount of density of animals in that spot. And the way that they manage them is by bringing them out to different parts of the pasture in the morning and then bringing them back in in the afternoon and they really just stay in their paddocks in that time. And I've seen the paddocks, of course, which are completely devoid of vegetation. And it fits in with the narrative and having spoken with them that basically in the area, the, the capacity for profitability of these animal-based enterprises has really dipped specifically in the last decade or so as hotter temperatures and more infrequent rains have really just made it difficult to have forage, to have feed for these animals late into the season. And so the major desire here is just to extend the growing season of the pastures. And the dream would be to have green pastures all the way into through the summer and, and even in the beginning of autumn because autumn rains are increasingly less reliable. And as you can imagine, it just creates more input costs in feed and that reduces the profitability of the enterprises. Now, I forgot, so we split up for the afternoon. What were you mostly focused on again in the afternoon? Yeah, for me, the, the afternoon was focused on finding out more of the really exciting spots to test the next day. So we had multiple objectives, and one of these was to find out the spots where potential water bodies could be a great place so not just water bodies but also different kind of features just yeah as you just said to kind of prolong the the season of having moisture in the soil so we want to identify more of these spots so for that really walk more of the valleys and explore some spots that we found on the first day and then also start a bit on the kind of sketching and analyzing on the potential concept design that at the end of day three that was our goal for the clients to see okay can we can we come up with a bit of an idea of a concept map of what this place could look like what is possible how features can be connected and so for me it was really a lot of walking a lot of seeing these different spots and marking them on the map taking some pictures and starting to identify interesting points yeah and one of the things that kind of brings in some experience and expertise and adds value to that concept map is not just identifying where features could go but also trying to figure out how they could be interconnected and how water could take the longest possible path before it leaves the property and honestly I think that's where more of the connection of the puzzle more of the intricacy and even the artistry comes in and it's something that we worked on much more yesterday so let's go over day three and what we focused on once we had access to the machinery. Yeah, day three, it was really exciting because you can see a landscape from, from a map. Uh, you can also walk a landscape, but you can never really know what's below the soil unless you start digging. And so it was really exciting to, to meet the excavator driver and to see under the soil. So we had identified three kind of major spots where we think it might make sense to start with the first water body, so to build some ponds and dams to hold water longer. And in those spots, basically, yeah, one by one, we did the test slicing and we dug down yeah, to different depths, depending on yeah, what we found and what that spot told us. Uh, yeah, maybe you want to go into what we actually looked for and how it looked below the soil. Yeah, for sure. So like you said, really prioritizing the areas that we thought would be a good place to start in implementation in those, in those different fields. So the valleys, uh, the places that could potentially hold water where it's being lost completely because there is a dam on site. We made some video content that we're posting about that and, and some of the challenges as well as the, the positive aspects of it. But when we're doing the test slices, part of the limitation is also going to be the size of the machine that we have. And 
you know, the horsepower that is required to get down into lower layers. As we mentioned before, one of the presences in the, the subsoil is this sedimentary rock, which we've just kind of been referring to as schist. I don't think that's a technical term, but it breaks up into really kind of fine particles, little crystal formations. And though I don't know what the primary minerals are in it, the characteristic is pretty distinct. It'll sheet off almost like slate, but with more of a sandstone texture. And usually we were hitting that layer somewhere between a meter or a meter and a half as we dug down. I was actually quite impressed with the amount of topsoil that we were moving around and how uncompacted it was in many, especially the valleys, because I don't think we did any test spots in any of the ridges where, quite frankly, I would expect there to be more rock, less clay, and poorer topsoil. But in the valleys themselves, there was fairly good structure, quite red, which would indicate a presence of iron, among other things. And we almost always found at least a 20, 30 centimeter layer of lighter kind of grayish yellow clay, quite heavy clay in fact, and doing the, te the texture tests in each of the bucketfuls of soil that came out helped us to figure out the texture and, and the quality, whether or not we could use that material as something to help to waterproof. Take the second exit to North Tin. Oh yeah, we're driving, so every once in a while the GPS is going to cut us off. Is there a way to turn that off? The audio? Yeah, there is. And so beyond that clay layer, very consistently we were hitting that schist, as we're calling it. In some cases, the bucket was able to break through and get below that, and we could see kind of the amount of heavy clay that was holding that, uh, you know, fractured rock together. And in other cases, the stones and the compaction or just the, the quantity of that was, was too dense and we weren't able to break through it and see anything below. And so, you know, there are some limitations with working with a smaller machine. I think the one that we had access to was about seven tons. And when you're actually going in there and building a larger feature, it's often more economical to get a larger machine somewhere between 10 and 20 tons. And that would definitely make it more possible to break through that layer. And quite honestly, we don't know what would be under there yet. But that was enough information to give us confidence that we had at least the, the core materials that we would need, namely the clay. And it was at a layer that was not too deep that we would really have to strain or, or bring in big machinery to get access to it. Now, that being said, not all of the clay was, you know, super dense or had enough fine particles or less gritty material that I would be confident that it would hold water all of the season. But there's still so many things that you could do even with imperfect material. What were some of the conclusions that you got from the test slices we were able to do? Yeah, we found some spots that were kind of from the geology or the topography of the land that would be great for water bodies. So we basically had a valley where the two walls of the valley, are, which would mean that the wall itself would not have to be that long to hold quite a bit of water in that valley. So we have a few spots of those. And we had some others where the, where the valley is a bit gentler, which means that the wall itself needs to be a bit longer to hold, to hold water in it. And it was a bit tricky because unfortunately in the spots that require less earth movement because the wall could be smaller, there we often had a little bit more of the what we call schist material in there. And then in some of the other spots we had really a lot of great clay, but in those the wall needs to be longer. So those are a few of the tricky parts where you then need to decide how you build. But I think with what we what we saw on site, it should definitely be possible to build these kind of bodies at definitely infiltration basins so that will definitely hold water for a while and we need to see how tight we can get them. So one thing we discussed as a possible option is that the key of the dam, so that's basically in the, in the center of a dam, you always build a key, so an impermeable layer of compacted clay that kind of acts as the, yeah, as the layer that holds the water in. Those sometimes can be quite quite narrow and thin if you have really good clay material or if you can't find enough good material. But if you have a bit kind of less quality, you just have to make them a bit wider. And quite likely that's what we'll be 
doing on this side so that we don't just have a small one the size of a bucket of an excavator but we will likely make it the track size of a bulldozer so that's something we concluded that to increase the kind of tightness of of the dams we will likely work with a mix of excavator and bulldozer and then really compact thick key and then that way yeah we have quite a bit of confidence that it should hold water after rains and then we need to see also in the different spots but yeah it's going to be a very long process because there are so many potential spots and deciding which one to start with it's going to be one of the great things we'll be doing with our collaborators with the farm owners in the coming weeks yeah, and one thing that we talked about a lot with them is that in general, both Nick and I favor a more decentralized. At the moment, everything that is being captured on the land, which emits large areas, is being concentrated in a single dam. And there are advantages and disadvantages to that. But in general, it's also going to collect all of the sediment. And if there's any failure or if uh, not enough water is held in that you don't really have any other backup. And so I guess before we talk more about how we made decisions on the concept map, it's worth knowing too that the desires or the aspirations for this farm really helped to inform how we came up with the concept map and about now the decision-making process in how we came up with that concept map. So obviously we identified places that could serve as uh, water holding bodies, infiltration basins, any number of things. The test slices gave us information as to whether or not those features might be feasible or economical to put in. But there's still a lot of unknowns and it's part of the reason why we do <clears throat> and honestly it's part of the reason why we don't do more in-depth design work, especially putting a lot of energy into you know the aesthetics and all of the other aspects that can make a really informed design like a presentation or, or an engineering spec. There is a lot that is going to be uncovered in the installation process that quite frankly we can't know for certain right now and knowing that that is inevitably going to come up. Nick, how do you look through the criteria and kind of the order of operations when putting in the elements of a concept map? Yeah, one thing I really like to focus on at the beginning is where is the property losing water and not using it in any kind of good capacity. So many of the water catchment areas, so the different valleys and connected valleys that form one of the catchment areas, quite a few of them on almost any landscape are just losing water. So they're shedding water and that's probably also where the word watershed comes from that you probably heard before. And so that's one of the first places where I like to look and see, okay, can we plug those? So you can imagine those as kind of a big bathtub, but if the bathtub doesn't have a plug in it, doesn't have a drain, it just all flows out. And so those are strategic points where quite often with a bit of work, you can hold a lot of water because the catchment area is just much bigger than if you would interact further up in the landscape. Then another really interesting point for me is to find the spots where water accumulates anyway so quite often in landscapes after rains you can see these spots where it's really wet sometimes you even have standing water sometimes flowing water so those are the other spots where it's like okay can we hold water longer with a little bit of work so those spots are really interesting and then of course it's great to have water high up in the landscape so that's also something interesting where we can see okay is there a spot that's really beneficial to hold water higher up so that when the water infiltrates into the soil there, as it moves lower into the landscape in the subsoil, where it can have a bigger impact. So those are some of the things, but quite often another one that usually follows after water is access. But access and water are sometimes a bit inter intertwined on those. So on the farm, the owners told us that there are a few spots where the cars often get stuck and it was very very obvious because all those spots were low spots in the landscape so the road it's not really a road it's just the areas where they chose to drive for now it was often at the low spot of valleys and then sometimes there was yeah a spot where the water had nowhere else to go so it was pooling there and then when you drive through that obviously it's really muddy 
So that's also another thing where, where I really like to focus on at the beginning. How are the roads at the moment and how could they be slightly differently positioned to on the one hand have a road that lasts longer so it doesn't have that much erosion but also it has less problems with these kind of spots where you sink in and then most importantly how could roads be used to bring water from A to B to kind of zigzag it through the landscape and then that's a bit of an idea of, of what I'm working at so finding these interesting points and then figuring out how we can connect them and increase catchment. And, you know, all of these things are somewhat dependent on the primary use, the main goals of the landowners as well. They've decided to really focus on animal-based enterprises right now. They have a flock of about 100 sheep and goats. And the main way to make money through that is by growing your feed on pasture. And any portion of the season, whether that's winter or summer, where there is just not enough food or forage for the animals is going to be an expense in having to bring in hay or pelletized feed or whatever it is that you're going to be supplementing with what they're not able to get on those grasses. And that definitely informed the design that we kind of proposed in the concept map. It's because we need even distribution of water all along these pastures, which, you know, the topography is not super steep, not super rugged. It's pretty smooth rolling hills. But there's still quite a few peaks and ridges that dry out quickly because of their exposure and just for the angles that they're on. And so getting water out to those areas and more evenly irrigating passively the pastures out there is going to have a real impact on the amount of forage that they're able to both grow when water is available and store for the drought period, which quite frankly in this region is the main off season. And it's quite inconvenient because it's also when you have the biggest solar potential. It's when you could be photosynthesizing and growing the most in the summer. But because it tends to be so dry and so hot, that's actually when most of the plants are either dormant or completely dead and have already long since gone to seed. The winter, even though there's much less hours of sunlight, tends to be cooler and have a lot more moisture depending on the year and so this is where we're seeing it green at the moment but we also know what this looks like later in the season as well and so extending that out trying to improve or increase just the amount of photosynthetic potential on these pastures is really the goal there and so I guess we can kind of wrap up what the process looked like how did the presentation and the explanation of the concept map go for you, Nick? Since you kind of took the lead on this, you were definitely the lead designer in the concept. How do you feel like the ideas were both received and what are the next steps afterwards? Yeah, I think it was really nice throughout the three days because it was not like we were working behind a curtain and then suddenly on day three we revealed what we've been doing the whole time. So we really want to bring the farm owners along throughout the whole process and explain what we're looking for, explain kind of what we're planning. So that was great. Throughout the process, we had a lot of these kind of aha moments that we could see with the owners. And that's really what we're going for because oftentimes when you're getting a new piece of land or you're getting into farming and these kind of landscapes, you often just see what all these farms look like. And generally they have some water and yeah, a lot of erosion during the winter and then they're completely brown in summer and many ex kind of accept that and so when we explained that you can have a really great decentralized water holding system on there and that you can circulate water across that's a fantastic kind of moment for many to think like oh wow more could be possible we just need to get the water systems right and then have a passive system throughout and I think the greatest moment of the process uh, actually happened on, on the day where we had the excavator. So on the third day, it was something very unexpected. But we found a new excavator driver here. And of course, for the owners, it's always interesting to know, like, could this be a driver to work with on the long term? So it was really reliable. We had another driver planned, but he canceled. So we found this one and very last minute he was able to come. And so we wanted to test a bit, okay, how, how good are his skills? Like, could this be someone to work with on the long term? So on one of the test slices that we did in a strategic point, we actually thought like, okay, hey, let's, let's test to build a little 
at that point we just said let's build a little hole and see how he kind of makes the edges and how, how he works with the machine and then see if that hole fills up with water and as he was working quite quickly it became clear that this could be a really nice place for a small infiltration pond so we thought hey let's invest uh, maybe a little bit more time and, and focus on that so we built this little infiltration pond with a nice little curved spillway rock armored all that and so we we built this feature in just one and a half hours because he was a really good and fast operator we could communicate greatly and then we had a feature and because there was still some running water from the last rain within kind of an hour it filled up so we already have the first pond that is working uh, that is aerating air and there you could really see it in the owner's eyes it was like wow like we can do this on the land and it doesn't have to take months to to build and i think that was the moment where we could really show like look this is the kind of things we can do all over the farm this is what is possible and that was just beautiful to see their excitement and then in the process we we had lots of different features so the the farm has so many potential spots to build so i think there are over 20 spots that make it really easy to or not easy but that make it quite possible to build different kind of water features and there are beautiful ways to connect them with different terraces different roads and you could really see the excitement because that's what you need when you have this system going even if you leave the farm completely alone because of the water system it will regenerate over time and then when you add the positive animal impact on top everything is possible so yeah for me it was really exciting the big part that we need to figure out over the coming weeks is really going deeper into the holistic context and figuring out what they want this farm to be but yeah that's definitely your strong point so what were your observations yeah, well, I'm really glad that you told that story about that serendipitous moment with the machinery operator. I can't believe we almost forgot to talk about that. It was really impactful to see how quickly and with such minimal effort you could create a pretty well-functioning water body. I mean, obviously, we're, we weren't able to make it at the standard that we normally would, and it's in a spot that we're likely to come back in and put a more professional dam that's more engineered. But, you know, as an example of how quickly you could make better use of the water that's already currently escaping from the land that was really impactful we all got to see it in real time and it was small enough that we could play and have fun with it too but like you said the next steps from here are going to be more seriously developing what we call the the holistic context i'm referring to the process from holistic management the savory institute that i use quite extensively when working with clients and it's just a way of identifying the vision the key priorities that the decision makers on this project, both the owners and the people who are managing the farm on the land when they're away, kind of come together and understand collectively so that they can all make decisions from the interest of what the team is trying to achieve. That's a process that takes a little while, especially with more people and combining the shared vision that each one of them has individually into a cohesive plan is worth spending time on and we've already got a couple calls planned because I think it's very common and it's definitely the case for me as well when you have a new project even if you've been there for a while there's still a lot of ideas floating around there's tons of opportunity things that you could do but until you narrow down it's very hard to do any one of them well and that's part of the purpose for this exercise so that's really the next steps moving on from here and as that becomes more clear we'll start to put some dates in the calendar and plan a return visit in order to start to implement the first portions of the the water design concept that we presented yesterday. So that's a pretty good overview at this point of what these three days of site assessment, essential information gathering, and the precursors of putting a context together. And so that's going to wrap it up for this episode. But like I said, we've got a lot more to talk about on the next job that we're headed to right now. But before we go, I just want to remind you of one big opportunity that I've got coming up. I'm going to be teaching a water resources management course at the farm at La Junquera in the Murcia region of Spain in collaboration with the Regen Academy that they've got there. 
In four intensive days, we're going to go through some of the simple theory on how and why to manage water resources on the landscape. And then we're actually going to go out onto the field, onto that farm in a small section of the watershed and design it with the students and actually go through the implementation as well. It's a lot to fit into four days. They're also going to cover the regulatory considerations and the red tape that you need to be aware of when you're doing water work in Spain. And so I'm really looking forward to this. It's going to be held between the 9th and the 12th of March, and it's also going to be held in Spanish. So if you speak Spanish, if you know anybody in your network who does, who would really like to take this kind of intensive practical course, I'll put all the links on how you can sign up in the show notes for this episode on the website at regenerativeskills.com. And that'll do it for this episode. Now, before we wrap this up, just remember that these episodes are only the beginning of the learning resources, design and coaching services, in-person courses, and interactive community that are available through Regenerative Skills. The Discord server is our free community where you can connect with other like-minded listeners, exchange ideas, stories, tips, and resources, as well as interact with me directly and quite a few former guests from this show. Our Instagram account, at regen underscore skills, is the best place to see the projects that me and the team are working on, both for clients and collaborators, as well as on our own properties. I'll also be announcing the certification courses, workshops, and gatherings that we've got coming up later this year. If you're interested in getting dedicated support for your own project, you can now schedule a free planning session with one of our team members through the request form on our website. You can also find all the links, show notes, and past resources there at regenerativeskills.com. We truly believe that no matter your experience, your knowledge, abilities, resources, or background, you can be a powerful force for regeneration on this planet. And we're here to help you find your path. So as always, remember to keep taking those little steps every day towards a regenerative future. And I'll be right by your side along the way.